I agree with everything that was just said. Um, <laughs> so that's good. Um, but what I want to talk about uh, this morning is a little bit more on systemics. Um, and this sounds boring, and maybe it is, but um, to just say that we want everyone to move downtown is one thing, but to say that we need everyone to move downtown is a different argument um, and a different discussion. Um, we've done a really good job in this country of defining what normal is, right? <laughs> so we could objectively define what wasn't normal. And we started to isolate these things into pockets of isolation, these marginalized populations. This is where loud people live, this is where educated people live, this is where gay and lesbian people live, right? And we crafted this around our zoning ordinances. We designed communities like this. We get places that look like this. This was prescriptive, this was designed. We intended it to look this way, right? And it changed the way we interact with each other, uh, and it changed the makeup of our everyday routine. Don't think for a second that if I live in one of those houses in that upper slide, that I'm walking to this shopping district, right? It changed how we maneuver through things. And not to offend every social media person in the room, um, but there's a conversation to be said that placeless communication models um, often result in placeless communities, right? So not to take anything away from Twitter, it's a wonderful tool, um, but you have to understand the most efficient communication model in the world is a city. Right? And we have to understand what that means. Um, this is what economic development used to look like. It's a fairly complex thing, but it was internalized. We all went to this central area for stuff. Milk, eggs, hammers, gossip, um, camaraderie, right? And it was an accessible model. Um, for the most part, everyone, children to seniors, could access this, right? We traded this for this. We couldn't figure out how to stitch together all these pockets of isolation. So we started to create these connectors, and it became an externalized system. Um, as a destination-based system, we have to go here to shop, I have to go here to work. Um, but when you look at this picture, you have to realize that over 80 million people in this country, they're too young, too old, or too poor to drive. They don't see this as a viaduct or an access. They see this as a hurdle. This is the Berlin Wall to them. Um, and we have to understand what that means because those priorities are changing. <laughs> this is a picture in an interview in a newspaper. Um, this man does this every morning so he can go to the gym to exercise. Okay? So think about that. Our places, our environments change the way we are. They change how we act and it needs to be addressed. You can model communities. It's not really that, simple, uh, that hard. It's a collection of stuff. Right? It's a very linear organizational pattern. Where we live is just a bunch of stuff. How we stitch it together is our everyday routine. And what we instinctively do is we rely on these filters, these accelerators, so we can access more stuff. Facebook, a car, you know, it just gets us to more stuff. The problem with these systems is when the funnels fail. You know, when gas is $7 a gallon. Or how annoying is work when email is down. Right? You lose that connection. Because social networks, communities shouldn't be organized that simple. It's not that clean. They look like this, right? And that's a hard thing to prescribe to people or explain that this is what you're striving to be. But think about it as a, uh, a nervous system, right? And every time I interact with you, that's a synapse, that's a surge, a pulse, and we're energizing this system. So if I think of your everyday routine, think of every time you engage someone, you know, in the geographic landscape and put that on a map. That's your map. If I do the same thing, we start to overlap these maps, and you'll start to see pockets of activity, pockets of energy um, of where these people are doing this in, in a place full thing. Um, good cities understand this. Great cities design for them to happen in specific areas. You know, and that's this downtown conversation. So to do that, we have to understand what these marginalized populations are and what they need. Because if we can accommodate them, if we can raise the quality of life for those individuals, we inherently raise the quality of life for everyone. Um, so the example I want to use today real quick is aging population, seniors. And between now and 2040, NES population will grow by 15%. That's pretty normal. Our 65 and older population grows by 90%. And that's projecting two things, aging baby boomers, you know, all these baby boomers finally getting old, and all of our youth leaving, brain drain. The problem is it's probably predicting one of the largest migratory shifts in American history. Brain drain people are moving to knowledge clusters. You, know, all, you can map them all over the place. Seniors are moving to places they can age in place. And we need to understand that because it matters to the survival of our communities that you can compete in a migratory shift like this. 
Um, what people don't realize is a, a very small fraction of, of seniors actually live in age-qualified housing, you know, retirement communities or whatever. Um, the rest of them live in communities just like us. Um, the difference is baby boomers don't picture retirement looking like this, right? They picture this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've never met a baby boomer to argue this point. This is what they, they think. In, retirement isn't quitting. Retirement is engaging on my terms when I want to and how I want to. So our systems, our communities have to be designed in a way to allow them to do that. Um, engagement is the new metric uh, by any standard. If you ask people simple questions like, do you think you have a high quality of life? Those that think they have a high level of engagement within their community, 40% more likely to answer that question, yes, I have a high quality of life. So it matters. It matters how we engage people. So obviously, that makes you think of Sesame Street. <laughs> um, Sesame Street was the first time we took a serious look at how we can engage the intellectual endurance of a child, right? And we spent a lot of money thinking about it. How long can I push a toddler to think about the letter A <laughs> before I have to reward him and disengage him with some entertainment? You ever notice Oscar the Grouch doesn't teach you letters and numbers, right? He's too entertaining. Kids wouldn't listen to him. He's the break. I can push you this far and then I have to give you a rest. And then I can push you harder and I have to give you a rest. Communities are designed the same way. The last lecture you know, uh, noted, uh, people are willing to walk 1,500 feet. That's five city blocks. How far away do you live from where you work? Well, it's more than five, so all of you drive. Because we've, met, we've, we've exceeded that threshold of tolerance. We're not willing to do that. So we have to understand what those are for all populations, not just the normal. Um, this is Mather's Cafe. This is a coffee shop in Chicago. This is a senior center disguised as Starbucks, okay? <laughs> Social workers are baristas. The word senior does not exist anywhere. You and I can go in there and get a sandwich and leave, never knowing we were in a senior center. But what they're doing is not only accommodating a frailer population, they're using that population as a critical mass to spark urban renewal. And that's the key, it's reciprocal. So think of any walkable downtown in Indiana, and we have them laying all over the place, right? this dense urban network that no one's really using to its full potential. If you understand this idea of the synaptic network of engaging people, you can take any marginalized population, college students, seniors, whatever, and start to understand how this could reciprocal revitalization model um, to not only accommodate them, but use them to stimulate the local economy. Um, so this is, you know, the typical downtown in Indiana. Uh, what you start doing is mapping out where you want this synaptic energy to happen. This is where we want activity to happen. And we start to incentivize it. We start to say, within these boundaries, we're going to offer service packages, municipal responsibility to offer service packages that you can buy as an a la carte menu, ranging from assisted daily living for seniors to transportation, home inspection, voucher programs. You get three movie tickets a year. Right? This is the history of retirement. This is the future of retirement communities. How do you empower people to age in place by offering them an engaging, walkable, independent neighborhood that they can, they can live and thrive in? Um, the, the thing that's exciting to me about that is, if you can engage those people, if you can get them to understand what that means, um, cities can use this massively growing senior population as fuel to fire um, failing downtowns until we get our act together. You know, this is my version of a stimulus package. Um, because if you can use them, they all need housing, and housing is an easy one. You know, everyone needs a place to live. Buying power, they're going to demand a certain market. 24-hour um, neighborhoods need food. Toilet paper, you know, when's, what neighborhood do you know has toilet paper in walking distance? You need that to live, <laughs> right? But people don't understand that. They don't understand the limitations of that. Working, between now and 2016, the end of the labor force's growth will be 56%, 65 and older. Can you keep them working? Can you keep them engaged to work? And volunteering, you know, a large base of our volunteerism is seniors. How can you straddle that and keep it? So when you think about this, when you start to think about what your community is envisioning for the future, I think we need to start thinking less about interstates and bypasses and more about Sesame Street and, and synaptic networks. So thank you.